Andrea. Hi, Cecilia. Hi, Heather. Hi, Nikki. Hi, Sarah. Hi, Kate. <laughs> Lovely to see you. How are you? I'm really well, thank you. Thanks for coming along and to join, join me this evening. Are you well? Thanks for, yeah, all well. Uh, thanks very much. Yeah, and uh, a big thank you as well to you and uh, Chiquilia for inviting us to join you. It's, uh, it really is our, 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 our pleasure to be, to be on, the, uh, on the chat tonight. Oh, it's absolutely our honour to have you. And I know your sisters are, are along with us as well. Um, I'll be talking to you, but they'll be there in the chat as well. So um, they can obviously comment if they'd like to. And we'd love to hear from everyone um, who's, who's met Brian and, and spent some time with him to chat along with us as well. Um, just a, a small housekeeping note to let everyone know that um, the Instagram Live will be on our IGTV after this, and we'll also be putting it on our videos page on the website for posterity, because we'd like to be able to keep this and go back and have a look at it. Um, and it is an absolute honour to talk to you tonight. I am, um, you know, I'm aware of, I, I obviously haven't met your dad. Um, he sadly passed a couple of years ago. Um, That's right, but yeah. Joy Daniels, um, you know, beautifully described him as a gentle man of fine character, and that's definitely the message that we've been we've been hearing from people throughout our chats that he was a gentleman um you know just in his personality and, and the way he treated people which is such an important thing um to hear for, from everyone but also that um david price described his work as um characterized by its delicate quality great sensitivity attention to fine detail and intricate textures um you know i can't wait for you to show some of the stuff that you've got and i know that everyone's going to enjoy this as well so i'll stop talking and i'm going to handle <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank you that was that was really lovely to uh, to hear kate and you know these last few weeks we've been watching a lot of your live chats um you know hearing um lots of friends and colleagues of dad's you know joy daniels heather held nick dequano joe vitola harvis you've all uh, given some beautiful talks and, and spoken about dad so highly and and for us to hear that as a family that that's really meant a, it meant a lot to us and uh, yeah, I think uh, the description you just gave there of dad that really sums him up in a in a in a nutshell. In a nutshell. So, um, like you said, Nikki and Julie are actually on online, and I am representing the whole Walker family this evening, including our stepmom Marion. And uh, we've put together a selection of um, photographs, which we hope um, tell dad's calligraphic journey. Um, it is only a small insight because there's so much to tell. And uh, in fact, we were um and ah, what should we show? What should we not show? And uh, um, I must say that, that we're not technical experts. So please <laughs> forgive us if we mix up our copper plate and our Spencerian. And uh, um, as I say, we've put together a series of, of images and um, we hope to tell Dad's story. They're not in any particular order, so um, you know, I, I go through them as they come. They don't unfortunately capture all the detail and the, and the colours that uh, went into his work, but uh, it certainly gives you an idea. And uh, as we've already discussed, we do have a, a project for the future um, because it's very important for us to keep Dad's name alive through his work and for people who knew Dad to be able to see that work and for others who didn't know dad to be inspired by him. And uh, so we really want to make Dad's uh, name and his work live on. And uh, what we've decided to do this year is put together a dedicated website in his name. Um, and what we'd love to do is hear from anyone who has any memories of dad or photographs of him that they would like to share with us. If they can get in touch, I've actually, if I just turn my camera around, I just, show you here we've put um an email together mm -hmm. um you can already see there a sample of dad's lettering underneath uh but please do feel free to contact us um and uh, we'll certainly let you know when we've got the website up and running uh, kate so you can maybe share Fantastic. that information with everyone yep, so okay. that's right for anyone who's not looking at the screen for whatever reason that's brian g walker calligrapher at gmail.com that's right yes 
Okay, so to begin. Let's go. <laughs> Let's go. Here he is. Uh, so this is Brian Walker, our dad. And when we think of him, this is one of the clearest images that comes to mind. Him sitting at his desk, writing and creating. So for those of you who didn't know him, calligraphy was his lifelong passion. But he wasn't just a calligrapher or a master penman or an artist or an illustrator. He was actually a professional qualified teacher of arts and crafts, including ceramics. And he was a deputy head and subsequently a head teacher at a middle school in Yorkshire, actually the school where Meenik and Julie also went. <laughs> so teaching uh, handwriting and calligraphy have always run a parallel course in his life. And I think that's, a, that's actually what made him very special because he was not only able to demonstrate what he could do, he could also teach you exactly how to do it. Mm. And, uh, you know, as we say, great performers are not necessarily great teachers, but dad was actually both. Uh, and I think, like I say, that's what made him uh, really special. Mm. He was a creative thinker he had exceptional skill and the eye of an eagle and he could see things that others couldn't and I've heard this from his students how they said you know your dad would pick up on things that you know we hadn't even noticed mm. and and this was something as well that he, he used to teach his uh, his students at, uh, at school you know when he was looking at a painting or an object or a piece of scenery he would ask them what can you see and after they'd given a first answer he would ask them to look again and say, you know, he'd say, look closer. Now tell me what you can see. So he always encouraged his students to look beyond the obvious. And uh, something he taught us as well as kids was that trees are not just green. Um, so I remember Cecilia telling us at the beginning that she couldn't actually find much information about dad on the uh, internet. Um, and that's actually quite true because dad was a very modest man. He was a no-fuss kind of man. You know, he wasn't interested in making a name for himself or pushing his own personal profile. He was very much about teaching and sharing, learning, inspiring and being inspired. And of course, we as his daughters were his biggest fans. Although we do know that he has quite a fan base out there as uh, <laughs> we, we receive some lovely comments uh, from, from his friends and colleagues. And, and, and we've, you know, dad used to share with us also when he used to receive some feedback from, um, from anyone on his work, he used to share that with us. I have hundreds of emails which he forwarded mm -hmm. to me saying, no, look what someone said. And um, yeah. So uh, let's move on. Just letting we... that um, Heather did say he was an absolute Hawkeye. It was amazing. <laughs> Fantastic. Carry on. <laughs> yeah. Um, so when we were all living at home, uh, there was no other place for dad to do his work but on the dining table. Mm -hmm. So he would lay out his pots and pens and get out the wooden artboard that you can see on the table here, mm -hmm. which I have to say also doubled up as a tap dance practice board for the three of us. <laughs> uh, so we used to fight who was having the board first. Um, and then he would close himself in the lounge and work for hours on end on his masterpieces. Um, what he did creatively was greatly influenced by his background of art and craftsmanship. Um, it was lettering and his love of nature, natural objects, but all these were merged together with life's visual and emotional experience as well, and they combined together contributed to his creations. So as kids, when dad was writing, we spent a lot of time playing outside so he could concentrate on his work. And before returning home, what we would do is peek through the lounge window to see if he was still sitting at the table. And if he was, we would stay out. And if he wasn't, we knew it was safe to come back home. <laughs> and uh, and on, that, on that table when we were kids, he had a, a green tablecloth, which he used to wipe his brushes clean. And it was literally splashed with every colour of the rainbow of ink and paint. And uh, we kind of used that as an excuse as well when we were kids to also have a little draw and a doodle on the cloth. So it was actually a work of art in itself and, and, and carried a history of every pen and brush stroke that Dad did, particularly in the 1960s, 70s and, and, and 80s. 
Mm. Um, so you'll notice lots of things on that table, but there's uh, one object on the table in particular that I'd like to talk about, and that is his pack of playing cards. <laughs> so I'm not sure if, uh, if many of you knew this, but Dad was actually a member of the Magic Circle. And he loved doing sleight of hand card tricks. Um, and just like his calligraphy, he would practice for hours on end until he got his tricks just right. But as you can see in the video here, it wasn't the only reason that he uh, used his playing cards uh, for doing tricks. He actually used the card as a buffer between his hand and the paper to help facilitate a smooth gliding action when writing. And he used this technique particularly for his ornamental penmanship. Uh, and I hear that uh, there are quite a few penmen around the world who have also adopted this uh, magic trick and, uh, and, uh, and using dad's, uh, dad's technique. Oh, fantastic. We, uh, yeah. My father is with us tonight, so he might, he might be able to comment as well. He's already noted how much he loves the com um, combination of calligraphy board and uh, against a tap board, as you'll know. So, <laughs> yes. <laughs> and Joy mentions that your dad did, often did tricks for her as well. That's right. And for us, when we were kids as, and, and our grandchildren as well, yeah, he was, uh, it, it wasn't just with cards as well, also with, uh, with money and he used to make cards appear uh, <laughs> from behind our ears and all sorts. Um, yeah, it was another one of his great passions. Um, but it was actually using this te technique and, and his skill that he would produce the most beautiful pieces of writing. And I don't know whether you can see that um, very well. Maybe I can just try if I can try and zoom maybe a little bit. Yeah, it's lovely. I can see There you go. I know there's a little reflection there of the, the light on the screen. But uh, as I say, he used to produce the most wonderful pieces of writing and actually as a family we were extremely lucky because even our shopping lists were works of art <laughs> <laughs> now i'm not sure if dad would have thanked me for digging out this photograph uh, with his wonky tie um, but it was just to say that his enthusiasm for calligraphy took hold at the age of 11 when during an art lesson his class was introduced to edged pen lettering and he just absolutely loved it. And that was the start of his lifelong passion. Um, it was actually our grandfather who in inspired him and encouraged Dag to practice good handwriting because our grandfather also had a very neat and fluent hand. Um, and whatever it was that granddad said to him certainly worked because his junior school report went from handwriting a bit careless to handwriting a most neat and careful hand. Um, we, we find that quite amazing that someone could ever have said to dad, handwriting a bit careless. But anyway. Um, he just started earlier than most. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but although there were many influences um, along the way and he, and he did have some help, uh, dad was actually largely self-taught as, as a calligrapher. So we know that as a child, dad was forever drawing and never wanted to do anything else but art. And it was between 1949 and 1953 that he started to carry out small commissions. And this is an example of the first commission that he did uh, in 1961 for his local church. It was the cover of a, a church magazine. And I put this in really just to show the contrast of where he started and where his journey took him over the years and here's another example of his of his writing so let me just zoom in again on that now it is a little bit light because obviously the with the ink and uh, and dad had such a, a light touch so you know i don't know how how much you can see he, I, the detail there but uh, actually you've reminded me I forgot to say at the start that if anyone has the comments um, scrolling up on top of the screen, um, you can tap the screen once to drop it and see you better. It's just that you're on the lower half of the screen. So, um, yeah, so they might have comments. It was absolutely stunning. Between the, the, the first piece that I wrote and this sample, which
different styles and, and techniques. And, and this is a piece that he did in 1987. I'm just going to try and zoom again. There we go. Um, he did this piece in 1987 in, in memory of our, of our mum, uh, who, who we lost in 1987. And, and for me, this really is one of his best pieces ever. It holds so much sentimental uh, value to us and, and is extremely, extremely personal. And you can see also how he used a combination of his love of art uh, and his writing together. And, and the detail on this is really phenomenal. And I think he talked a lot in in pieces that I've, I've read recently about his influences from um, Klee and also Cubism. Yes. And you can really see that in that piece, can't you? Um, Picasso. Uh, yes, absolutely. His, art yeah. his artistic presence really came through. And I know we'll see more of that as well. But that's absolutely amazing. Look at that. Yeah, I, I, can, I don't know whether I can scroll all the way to the bottom. Mm. Oh, it's kind of chopped off a little bit at the bottom, but it's all gilded with gold. And it's really, uh, as I say, a really special piece to us. So we wanted to uh, incorporate that in the presentation. Absolutely. But that did, did hundreds of commissions for people all over the UK. And the number of people that have told us that they have a piece of dad's work hanging in their home is really uh, unbelievable. And we also know that there are many people around the world that own a sample of Brian Walker calligraphy. Yeah. And we, again, we really would love to hear from you. So please drop us a line. Um, I was going to And while a lot of the original that at the start that, um, you know, I've seen. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can. Kate, are you there? I can't can you hear, hear me, Sarah? you very well, but I don't know if you... I can hear you now, yes. Can you hear me now? Okay, sorry. No, I, I was just going to say that um, I've, I've read that there's lots of people who have either envelopes or letter exchanges from him, and he works so hard to perfect even just an exchange envelope um, that they should definitely get in touch with you um, via that Brian G. Walker calligrapher at gmail.com. Yeah, that, that would be super. Um, so um, a lot of those original pieces that he did were actually sold. Um, and But the good thing for us is that Dad did keep a photographic catalogue of the pieces that he produced. So we have hundreds of slides of his work that we're currently going through and we're hoping to be able to share them with the calligraphy community on his uh, website. Uh, I have to say that he didn't give all his originals away. We also That's have our own private collection that in the later years, he stopped doing work for others. And, and thankfully, he did some work for, for us to keep. So we have a lovely collection. And this is actually one of those pieces that I am lucky to have hanging on my, uh, on my wall. Now, like I said, I'm no technical expert, but if you look at the detail and the different colouring on each and every letter, uh, this for me is just uh, another another one of my favourites. Although I think they're all my favourites, Kate. It's so hard to it's so hard to decide. Yeah. And I knew I know that you said when you were going through a lot of these things that for you it could be you know well, we were we were wondering um, it must be so difficult for you to tell if something was an original you know sort of the, the, a draft because I know that his his version of a draft was very different from what a lot, a lot of other people would Absolutely, consider. absolutely, right. because he was, he, you know, he was such a, a perfectionist, he would strive to be the best that he could and then aspire to be even better. Mm. So he had very, um, very high, high standards. And uh, so, yeah, I mean, for us, we, we look at, uh, we look at pieces and uh, for us, they're all pieces, uh, they're all masterpieces. Which brings me on to my next slide and to tell you another little story. Now, you might be wondering why these two pieces are all a bit creased and, and dog-eared. Uh, and that's because they were actually uh, two of Dad's cast-offs. So when we'd been out playing, we'd come home and find the mm. bin absolutely full of these um, <laughs> pieces. Um, but what Dad didn't know is that for years... Uh, myself and my sister would actually sneak into the bin and pull them out and and, and rescue them. So uh, they might be a little bit dog-eared and creased, but uh, we're so glad that we salvaged them. So I'll just maybe zoom in again here as well. So 
like yeah. I said, uh, perfection I was his I mean, goal. And uh, for, ne for the... I'm sorry, Kate. Sorry, no, I, th I was just going to say the, uh, the, the connection for me is a little bit tricky. So I'm not sure if I'm seeing it blurry and everyone else is. If everyone yes. else can see it, that's great. Give us lots of hearts. That's wonderful. Um, I can see it, but it's just a little bit blurry. <laughs> so I'm sorry about the connection troubles. Yeah. Okay, no problem. Um, so uh, as I was saying, perfection yeah. was perfection was his goal. And uh, for, the, for those of you who did know him, you may agree that he was actually quite self-critical. Um, you know, he would pick up on the slightest imperfection, whether it be, I don't know, the letter spacing or maybe an ascender wasn't quite long enough or, you know, heaven forbid he made a, made a, a spelling mistake. But if he wasn't happy with something, he would just start all over again. And uh, he had exceptionally high standards, but at the same time, he did understand the beauty of making mistakes and learning from those mistakes. So the one on the left is a commission that he did in 1986. You can see there he had a different signature uh, in the early days. And then here is one of his first uh, attempts at his Master Penman certificate for Iampeth. And you can see it all got folded up and, and, and thrown away. And you can see it's marked on there various different uh, uh. different things that he wanted he wanted to change. But um, so I think having shown you that example, I think perhaps it's better now that I show you the final version of the certificate. And here it is. And this certificate actually took him uh, six weeks to just going to sorry, just going to zoom in. It actually took him six weeks to perfect and uh, obviously hangs extremely proudly on on the wall. Um, for those of you who didn't know, Dad was the first master penman outside of the USA, and as we hear it, he is considered to be very end of it, so you can see the lettering. Um, what I'd like to say is that, as far as we know and, and remember, Dad didn't seek out the honor of becoming a master penman. He was actually approached by Iampeth and was automatically approved based on his ability, uh, the work that he was doing, and also the contribution to Spenserian script in the UK. Um, I'm sure some of you know that he established a Spenserian study group in the city of York. And I believe at the time, he was the only promoter of Spenserian uh, script in the UK. Um, this group then continued as a postal group with more than 60 members worldwide, and he was corresponding with uh, people in New Zealand, Japan, Australia, Ireland, just, just to name, name a few. Uh, so he, he promoted the appreciation, understanding, study and practice of Spenserian script and ornamental penmanship. And he did it with an absolute passion. But I will come back to um, Spenserian in just a second because I also wanted to highlight something else. Um, Dad wasn't only instrumental in setting up the Spenserian study group in the UK. He was actually instrumental in setting up various other calligraphy groups, particularly in the north of, uh, north of England. And when he started in the 80s, there were actually no calligraphy groups in the north at all. And it was, you know, thanks to Dad's input and influence that uh, there was uh, an upsurge of new groups being form and formed. And uh, Dad was contacted then subsequently by various different uh, people wanting to set up groups. So he would advise them on how to do that. And then he would often become a guest lecturer at those groups. And I have to give a big shout out to CLASS. I'm sure you know that he was one of the 12 founding members of CLASS. And this was something that was really particularly close to his heart. So he was not only an honorary fellow, but he also serving the officer. Uh, he was also involved in the formation and examining of the national diploma and he was co-examiner of the class teacher accredita accreditation uh, scheme and I think if you if you can see on the photograph there he is proudly wearing his class t-shirt. I'm not sure if you can see that but there he is in his class t-shirt. <laughs> so he really loved having close contact with like-minded people, teaching workshops and organizing various events. And we know that he was an 
an inspiration to many wonderful people that he met along the way. You know, he was there to help them and guide anyone really who was interested in learning calligraphy. And I have to say something that we, we, uh, we learnt uh, uh, quite recently when we've started to sort of look through all, all his things and, uh, and, and, and read some of the stories about him. But um, he actually collected rare items of original penmanship and he willingly and trustingly loaned these for study purposes to his UK members through a loan scheme. And I think that tells you something about the type of man that dad was. You know, he was right. very generous. He was very yeah. willing to share his, his knowledge and his expertise with anyone yeah. who needed his help or guidance. Yeah. Um, and I don't know whether you can read this but I, I, I'll zoom in just a second but he wrote this piece That's just right. to practice his handwriting in, in 2012 and it says the exchange of letters okay sorry can you hear me thought and feeling to which their electronic replacements cannot do justice um, Dad was a little bit anti-technology. He, 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 you know, he preferred to handwrite his letters still, and uh, he corresponded and tutored with people all over the world, making lifelong friendships along the way. And that was something that he absolutely loved. Uh, it wasn't just about the calligraphy; it was it was about the the friendship. And uh, as I said before, he he often shared with us the wonderful comments and feedback he received from his students and fellow scribes about his work. And uh, we have a collection of draft letters and envelopes that he wrote to people because, as you said, Kate, you know, he would practice before sending what he considered the, uh, the final version, the, the perfect version. Uh, and in addition, he also kept and collected all the wonderful letters and cards that he received in return. So we have got some beautiful envelopes written by all his uh, wonderful um, colleagues and, and, and students. Uh, um, maybe I just quickly zoom in again so you can see another sample of his writing. Okay, so this is yeah. another wonderful piece. Uh, I'm going to zoom straight in onto this one. Again, you get to see some of his uh, artwork there at the. Uh, In 97, Dad had never actually heard of Spenserian script, but once he discovered it, there was really no stopping him. I'm sorry, Kate, are you still there? We could uh, breaking up. Kate, can you still hear me? I, I am still here. I can hear you talking, but um, I know that I'm... Yes, I me. can. Sorry, I keep going. <laughs> um, right, so carry on. Okay, I'll, okay, I'll keep going. Yes. Um, so, he, as I said, he'd never actually heard of Spenserian script um, until 1997. So he didn't actually start writing Spenserian, studying Spenserian, until the age of 59, which was actually quite late in his career. And to think that he achieved um, such a high level of expertise in, in such a short space of time, I think is an inspiration in itself. Um, so the message to everyone is it's never too late to start something new. So if you if you have a passion or if you have a new interest, go for it. That's what that's what um, you know. That's what dad that's what dad did. I'm just going to scroll down a little bit more. Yeah. So just just to give you the the story of how he got into Spencer and it was actually when he was at a, a, a class meeting. And uh, there was a, a, a book by Michael Sill, volume two, that was being passed around the table. And inside the acquired a copy of um, volume two and later also the volume one. And he set to with the utmost dedication and determination in learning how to write Spenserian. And he also acquired various original. Hi, Sarah. <laughs> 
Okay, we're back again. Sorry. <laughs> froze for me. Um, you were showing your dad's school handwriting. Um, uh, the pictures of the the mountains and and that thing. I'm. I think you might have been able to continue. Yes. Um, so maybe around. Um, Hi, Kate. Hi, Kate. Are you, are you there? <laughs> okay. So I'm not. I'm not sure. I'm not sure if you saw this one. I. Th I think perhaps you did because I saw some love house playing. I'm here. Yeah, hello, I can hello, hear you. Hello. Hello. Move on to this next next piece. Sorry, bear with me a second. That's fine. Thank okay. You. Yeah. So this is another, uh, just another example of a different style that he was uh, was writing, um, and and again, as I say, was was influenced from from his travels uh, on that uh, on that cruise. Wow. And just to show you another another piece um which is another one of my favorite ones uh, i just absolutely love the verse on this one had i the heavens embroidered cloths uh this is absolutely uh, absolutely beautiful Amazing. it was just to give you an example of the the different styles you know he was always seeking to do something something new and this uh, again this is another one of my favorites um so just moving on now, uh, back again to Dad's Dad's is not to mention his various potions and powders and paints. And he used old jam jars to put them in and stuck sticky labels on them written in his hand. And as you can see, he's got a Nescafe, a Nescafe jar of tanning and a, a golden shred marmalade jar with some ungreen powder in it. He didn't put a label on that one. Um, and uh, I actually recently brought uh -huh. some of Dad's jars back to Italy with me. And I have to say, I was petrified at being stopped by airport security. Uh, I wasn't sure yeah. how I was going to explain the contents of all these jars, especially that little pot at the front there, the one with white powder in that has a sticky label on saying marked ground sugar i don't know how much they would have uh, believed me on on that one but um, but there's there's one particular little pot in his collection that he and we are extremely proud of and that's his very own walker's copper plate uh, ink uh, an iron gall ink which i'm sure a lot of you are still uh, are familiar with and, and are using so he actually started to make this ink in, I think it was around 1997, uh, for his own personal use. And that was because he couldn't find an ink that he felt was good enough to do what he wanted to do. So he spent hours and hours mixing his ingredients yeah. and developing a, a, a secret recipe. But uh, I've learned recently from a wonderful chat that I had with Heather, Heather, Heather Held, that dad yeah. didn't only have a secret recipe for ink, he actually had various other magic potions that he invented, including one for gesso and the perfect white ink. And uh, I hear from Heather that even one of them even included a spot of whiskey. Um, but um, dad was an avid Harry, Harry Potter fan. So we think that that's maybe where he, uh, <laughs> he got yeah. his inventions from. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> yeah. Um, but it's actually Simon Rouse now from Scribblers who produces and sells Dad's ink on a larger scale. He yes. was, as we call him, the chosen one who Dad trusted with his special recipe. Although yeah. Simon does tell me that uh, the recipe actually wasn't written down. Yes. Um, so he, uh, yeah, which is, uh, I, I, that's, that's another story. Well, um, but, a little heads up that Simon will be joining us this week so oh, we'll that's fantastic. Here. That's fantastic. so we'll hear more about that 
Thursday. Yeah, I mean, Simon, Simon tells me that he still feels today very honored and privileged to have been selected by Dad. Um, have his ink with it. Dad actually put Simon through his paces in, the, in teaching him how to, um, how to, to make the recipe. And um, with those first batches, um, Simon would send them back to Dad so he could do uh, a quality test on them all. And, and uh, I know that he actually sent him a lot of bottles before Dad gave him the, the go ahead for it to be sold through Scribblers. But um, as I say, there's a lot more to that story. And if Simon's joining you, I'll leave that to him to tell you. But uh, just to say the ink is now sold to 38 different countries around the world. Argentina, Australia, Brazil, Singapore, the States, India, Hong Kong, just to name a few of them. And of course, across the UK and, and Europe. And actually, it even has its own hashtag. So I don't know whether you can see that clearly on the screen. Uh, but we have to say that we follow the hashtag uh, very closely and we love seeing your samples um, and your posts when you've used Dad's Ink. So please, if ever you are using his ink at all, please remember the hashtag and, and post, it, uh, post it onto the, uh, onto the site because we're following you. And uh, this takes me to another milestone for us in Dad's calligraphy, uh, which uh, uh, again was... Uh, uh, I know was appreciated by many, many people in the calligraphy community, and that was the Leonard Extra Fine Principle nib. Um, now, as I know it, uh, the idea to create a nib came, I believe, after a discussion with his good friend Nick DeQuano, uh, when they were talking about the poor quality of pointed pen nibs available to Spencerians. And Dad was looking to create something that was equal in quality and performance to many vintage nibs used a century ago, uh, but no one seemed interested in making them. And I, I know Nick also, I think, uh, approached different, different companies. And it was only when Dad um, spoke with Nick Stockbridge from um, Leonard & Co Limited and Manuscript Pens Limited that um, he, he managed to... Um, uh, you know, move forward with the nib and, and get it into production. So after considerable discussion and, uh, and also after Dad sacrificed one of his precious principalities um, to give to the company as a, as a sample, they finally gave the go ahead to see what their engineer could uh, come up with. And, and months later, Dad received some prototypes based on the principality which he posed to a group of his pen friends, especially in the United States, to, to gauge reaction. Um, he then gathered that feedback and took it back to, to Lennox. And um, they, there was a lot of this toing and froing. They'd produce a, a sample and then Dad would distribute it and get the feedback and it would come back. And uh, it was in 2005 that the, the, the uh, Lennox EF principal nib actually to this uh, story which happened in in imprinted onto the uh, onto the nib and we're told that it is as near to the principality as uh, possible as it is possible to achieve today using a combination of technology and and the few remaining old hand uh, methods um that only did a minimal order uh, of the walker fine writer due to the high quantities required for production so uh, if you have one uh, treasure it and uh, and take good care of it um, so I'd like to go back now to his board because this is a, a, a particular photograph that, uh, that I absolutely um, I absolutely love. Um, I think I mentioned earlier that Dad would watch and learn from the greats. Uh, he would study and understand the core principles of individual styles. 
he would adapt them in the basic form, practice and practice until he reached perfection. And then he would add his own twist on them. And here you can see um, in this particular photograph, the portrait that he was working on at the time, which is a photo taken of Master Penman, uh, E.W. Bloser. Uh, I'm not sure if many of you know, but uh, Dad actually gave this piece of work as a donation to the Iampeth silent auction. Um, and I know that he also did this as a sign of appreciation to his good friend Heather Hell, who was a big supporter of his Spencerian study group, and I think also uh, president of I am. Hi, Hi Kate, <laughs> back again. <laughs> so just to let you know what was happening, um, yes. I could see that everyone could see you and hear you. It's just no one could hear. I couldn't hear anything, and okay. nobody could hear me. So okay. I just wanted to make sure that you weren't kind of asking questions or saying something and I was just sitting here. Like, <laughs> so. No, no, the, 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 it just went completely went down for me. So, um, a, I mean, this has happened before and we just, we just plow on and we'll get there. We'll get all the information in. I appreciate it. We will. We'll and, keep going. <laughs> yeah. So I know that you're up to showing the portrait at the, po at the point that I, um, that I stopped. So if you're happy to pick up from there. Absolutely. Absolutely. You. Okay, so uh, just to quickly show you, this was the final version of the uh, portrait, which also featured on the front cover of, cover of uh, Iampus Penman, Penman Journal. But this wasn't actually the only portrait that Dad uh, drew. He drew me and my sisters when we were young children, and years later he went on to draw each of his grandchild, uh, grandchildren, and we're thrilled to have such treasures in our family. So. Here you can see uh, the, the five girls, we're three, three sisters and we have uh, five girls in the family. Just quickly zoom through them, can't really see the, the detail. Um, but we also have Charlie, uh, a little boy, and Dad was, Dad was so thrilled when Charlie came along, at least at last, you know, to have a little boy in the family. So we think that's why Charlie was, uh, was lucky and got three portraits where the girls only actually only got, uh, only <laughs> got one. Uh -huh. And uh, yeah, and I just put this family photograph in because uh, I, I love this picture of, uh, of Dad with all the grandchildren and it, it really captures Dad's deep love of nature and the environment which have always played a significant part in his work and have been his prime source of inspiration. Yeah. So here's another little magic box from his studio, from his desk. So whenever dad went out, he would look and look for and collect tiny leaves and shells and little stones that he would often include in his piece of work. And we would also help look for things for him when we're on holiday or on the beach. But uh, I have to say, he didn't accept them all. He was uh, <laughs> quite particular about what would and, and wouldn't work. Would fit in the, uh, yeah. That's right. But he, uh, he had a, a really, a real uh, creative mind, as I said, and he was always looking uh, to experiment with new ideas and letter forms and techniques. And uh, he made this very unusual writing implement using bagpipe weeds. He had a friend who was a master piper, so uh, he used to get his uh, reject weeds from his friend and actually invented this uh, writing instrument, yeah. which leads me to my uh, next piece. That, sorry, um, is that the top of the what, where the bag pipe where the piper blows into the into the bag? Uh, I'm not actually 100% sure. It's actually two types of reeds. So okay. one is called a chanter reed, and the other is called a drone reed. Okay. Uh, but more than that, I I, I don't. Uh, I'm not okay. able to tell you. We have we'll have to do a Google search later. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, but it was uh, he used that bagpipe reed to produce. Um, an image that you, this image that you can see here on the screen and here he was trying to he, he wanted to see what would happen if he jumbled up the letters of the alphabet without making words and I, I don't know if any of you've ever tried this but um, uh, dad once said that the alphabet is about fun with letters so by all means have fun and uh, from this idea he transformed that into this which then transformed into this. Mm. And here you can see those lovely little leaves and shells that 
I showed you from his box. And I don't know whether you can see the detail um, on that lettering, but every single letter is so detailed and has different colours in it. I don't know. Let me just see if I can get even closer. So maybe that gives you a... Can you see that? Yeah. And that the, this piece for me is, a, again, I have to keep... I know I keep saying it, but it's another one of my... Another one of my favourites. Yeah. Um, so staying on the nature theme, let me just move the camera again. Um, this is something that came out of one of his scrapbooks. He has some amazing scrapbooks uh, with, with some wonderful, wonderful things in. Um, and this was a, 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 an idea that he was uh, developing. Uh, everything that grows is life itself and you can see through his letters that he's got some little grasses growing through there so what he would do he would take a concept and then transform it in something into something truly uh, magical like this piece here now I don't know whether you can see that but this actually says hedge the word hedgerow mm -hmm. um, and uh, as I say if you look if you look a little bit closer you can see those grasses growing in between each uh, letter. And his own, whole idea behind this concept was to try to express the meaning of a word in visual terms rather than it just being, being a word. And unfortunately, these photographs don't actually do no, the, no. Uh, his work justice because you can't really see the, the subtleties of the, of the colored pencils there, but um, hopefully it just gives you an idea. What I love about that piece and some some of these pieces with the colouring pencil, I know that he he says that he spent as much time erasing some of the the pencil work as he did That's coloring, right. coloring it in to really get that balance and the you know so that times you got to spend as much taking away. <laughs> That's right. That's right. And he'd also use a, an ordinary pencil to work over the top to add shades or to tone down some of those colours if they if they weren't uh, the quite quite right, the right colour. Amazing. Yeah. Um, so his philosophy was about form, structure, texture, shape, spacing, light pattern, colour, lines. It wasn't always just about the. I'm just going to zoom in again. It wasn't just all uh, all about the. Uh, the, the letters uh, in the letter shapes in themselves it was it was much more than that yeah um, so this brings me on now to a, a, another um, uh, part of dad's uh, dad's career which was his transformations and I'm, I'm not sure if some of you have uh, uh, have already seen these uh, these examples this is a, a photo in Austria and it's what gave him the idea of the transformations um, so these are it's it's one letter uh, repeated around four uh, quadrants and here you can see a repeat of the letter R in this doodle here on the on the right hand side uh, so we always said that he had no preconceived ideas of how these pieces would end up and uh, and the same thing with the titles he would just um, invent a title uh, merely on whatever he happened to be thinking about um, at the time. And a lot of these um, he produced for his own private collection. So we're very lucky to have a lot of these uh, mm. for, for ourselves between us. Um, here's another example. Um, this one he called the Celtic Shield because he said it reminded him of some ancient battle shield. And it uses the letter E again with colored pencils and ink. And if I zoom in, closely you should be able to see that around the edge there is um, a runic uh, alphabet which runs right around the edge it's so delicate I don't know whether you can yes. you can see yeah. that yeah, yeah. and uh, just to give another example here we have a repeated letter b this one was called blue butterflies and uh, this uh, another example dad called this one dance of the kelp because he thought it was like seaweed but we prefer to call it bally shoes um and this uh, is a, a repeat of the of the letter a and again another one from his um, transformation collection i have to say about this piece that we were honored to attend the uh, class annual uh, general meeting in march uh, well actually nikki and julie attended i had to cancel at the very last minute because okay. of the covid um, but we were invited to uh, present a, another award uh, in Dad's name and memory 
um, that the class have set up. And that, again, will continue for the next 10 years. And we're really hoping to be present at every annual general meeting to be able to present that prize and, and also to talk about that. Fantastic. Yeah. Now, this is, a, this is a piece I put in specifically for Cecilia because it's Italian. Mm -hmm. And uh, just to say, you know, Dad was inspired by lots of things uh, around him. This is uh, actually an Italian phrase written as graffiti on a wall that uh, was from one of his trips when he came to visit me in, in Italy. And this, again, was another one of his roughs that uh, I rescued. And I have to say, <laughs> I have it framed on my wall at home. Uh, and again, here's another uh, Italian quote that I found uh, once. I liked it and uh, I sent it to dad and uh, he's written this in various different, uh, different styles. And we've got lots of different uh, versions of this. It says, there is no hope if there is no passion. And again, you can see those beautiful colours in each and every uh, letter. Mm. Uh, I included this this piece because it has a, a, a funny, well, not so much a funny story, a, a bit of a sad story, really, um, because um, Dad actually sought the approval of EMI uh, Music Publishing and paid a copyright fee in order to be able to use the the lyrics of this song. I'm sure you all know it. I'm not going to sing it. Um, <laughs> he did this piece uh, for the Society of Scribes and Illuminators for an exhibition that they were doing in Covent Garden in 19, I think it's either 92 or 93. And um, he took it with him on the train uh, on his way down to London. Um, but unfortunately, when he got off the train, he left this piece of work behind him. And uh, when he realised, he raced back to try and see if it was still there, but unfortunately someone had taken it. So those hours and hours of practice and drawing just were gone in a second. And we really would love to know what happened to that piece of work. You're seeing it in black and white, but believe me, in colour and with the gilding, and it was absolutely, mm -hmm. oh, absolutely amazing. Mm -hmm. uh, but anyway, we hope that whoever did find it has it safely hanging on their wall and that they realise what a treasure they found that uh, that day. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's such a such a shame. But maybe one one day, you never know, through the website, maybe someone might uh, say, I found it. Um, but any. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, I mean, there wasn't a time when we went to visit dad that he didn't take us down to the studio and show us what he was currently working on. And we always viewed them in absolute awe and amazement. Um, these are some capital letters and flourishes that he did. You've got the capital letter B there. And I think here he was playing with the letter, the letter D. And I really could go on and on just showing you <laughs> hundreds and hundreds of uh, samples of his work because, as I said, we have, uh, you know, we have such a, a legacy and we're so lucky um, mm. and privileged to, to have, you know, so many pieces of, uh, of Dad's work. It's, you know, it's extremely uh, special, special to us. Uh, but I, I think this one really captures the lightness of his hand and the beauty of his writing. It's called Beautiful Penmanship and that's exactly, exactly what it is. So, in our opinion, Dad's hand was truly magical and, yeah. and, and, so, was, and so was he. And uh, we received this um, image recently from Joy, Daniel, from Joy Daniels, a, a lovely, lovely friend of Dad's. And, and we're still very much in touch with, uh, with Joy uh, ourselves. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I think this picture, um, as we're coming to the end, really encapsulates Dad in his, in his world. Um, and just to, just to finish... Um, we don't have very many videos of Dad, actually, we have very, very few of him writing. So again, if anyone does have anything, any videos they'd like to share with us, please, um, please do, do contact us. But uh, um, yes. email just email finish... Brian G. Walker Calligrapher at gmail.com. Yes, that's right. But, uh, you know, I, as I say, we, we, we put together the presentation. I hope you've enjoyed this insight of what it was like for us 
uh, growing up as the as daughters of a calligrapher and master penman, and that this inspires you to to learn more more about him. Um, as I said, he uh, always aimed to be as good as he could be, uh, and then aspire to be better. And it's an approach that I think is passed on to many people that he's mentored uh, throughout the years. And I know it's something certainly that uh, we daughters have been have inherited uh, have inherited from him. And if I can just share maybe a couple of his favourite quotations with you, which. Um, give uh, a, again an insight into dad's creative mindset which allowed him to explore so many different techniques and reach the level of expertise that he did and and the first one is um you think of things as they are and ask why i dream of things that never were and say why not and the second one uh, the second uh, quote is first of all you prove that something is impossible then show how it can be done. And I think Dad, through his calligraphy uh, journey, uh, he certainly showed how it could be done. And that brings me to the end, uh, Kate. Yeah. So, um, yeah, like I say, uh, I, hope, I hope you've enjoyed it. And uh, there's so much more of the story to tell. And, uh, and we will be uh, working now uh, to, to push that website forward fabulous i um just on that note i was going to remind everyone because some people obviously we've we've dropped out a couple of times a couple of new people might have joined so just to let everyone know that you will be putting together a website in his in his memory um to to consolidate all of this information um and that anyone who has received any and well, has any of brian's work at home or any memories to share please email the girls sarah nikki and julie at Brian G. Walker Calligrapher at gmail.com. Um, I also, uh, you were talking about some of his favorite quotes. I had another one here in one of the um, Copper Plate Special Interest Group, his tribute edition, um, which really resonated with me, which was give yourself more time. Don't try to hurry nature, enjoy the moment, which is just. Yes, yeah. yes. And he actually, um, I'm, I'm, I'm not a hundred percent sure but i'm quite sure that dad actually wrote those words himself it wasn't something that he t it wasn't a quote that he took from somewhere it was something he wrote himself and he wrote that on a on a bookmark for me and i have uh, on vellum yeah he did i could actually i should have been a, i should have shown that to you okay, um we have to I, we have to chat again kate and i'll show yeah, you it but, yeah, uh, yeah it's uh, it's uh, it's something that uh, another one of his uh, one of his treasures that we're we're lucky to have. Fabulous. Yeah. I, uh, I I mean we do have a little bit of time. I don't know how you are for time, but I thought I'd give people if they wanted to um, some time to ask any questions. Just you know a few minutes more. And while anyone's kind of making any comments, um, I just wanted to go back with you to the the transformation series. Yes. Then in the tribute. Um, uh, Chiswick edition for your dad um there's a whole piece there that he writes and explains in such beautiful detail about how he did the pieces that's right um, yes just phenomenal but one of the things he did say that i really wanted to ask you or your sisters um and this was written in 2011 so he commented on how um there are some letters that just don't naturally don't go well around the quadrant um but he would you know continue to try do you know if there were any letters that he just hated to do on the quadrant or didn't do or that he did try and, and eventually got it to work i mean just in your i know that you might not know yeah um the a letter that he didn't try i'm not sure of i know he wrote the letter e uh, a lot of times and and we've got i think there's i mean I, I think there's about 20 different letters in that in that series um again within the website we'd hope to be able to to share those to share okay. those with you but yeah, one that he one that didn't work. No, I'm not sure on that one. I don't know whether Nikki and Julie remember, but uh, but also uh, the one he he preferred the most as well. So that's yeah, really. Yeah, and the and the letter the letter E, um, the one with the letter E that I showed you earlier, he actually had uh, made into a brooch as well. So we have a silver brooch made with his letter E in the in the four quadrants, which is uh, again another another special treasure that we have. Yeah, yeah. Nick is also saying she's not sure either which. Uh, okay. That's fine. Which one. Yeah, but uh, you were Thank saying you. about the articles, um, Kate. Uh, yes. We have hundreds of articles that he wrote, which I'm trying to now collate okay. all together. 
um, yeah. to because he does give a lot of advice, um, including those special magic recipes. Because I found one also today um, <laughs> on those special magic recipes. So these are all little handy tips and things again, which we'd like to incorporate into the um, into the website and and to share. Um, you know, it's uh, extremely important for us that his legacy lives on and. Uh, and he continues to inspire people, even though he's no longer present with us. So that's uh, that's our project and that, and our objective uh, for the future. I, I, I certainly feel like he's present in many ways. So I I want to say personal thank you for for taking the time to share all of that amazing stuff with us. And uh, and I can't wait to see what you all come up with. And we'll of course help in any way we can. So hopefully you'll get lots of of. Um, emails coming through soon yeah we, we'd love to as i say we'd love to hear from you and thank you kate and a big thanks also to to cecilia you know we've uh, done lots of chats in preparing to do this uh, this talk and uh, you um you both do an amazing job and uh, and also the it, you know we, we haven't done anything like this before so to come onto to your platform and uh, and and share our story with you, you've you've really made us feel so much welcome and uh, so welcome and, and at ease. And uh, so, really, thank thank you from from all the Walker family, Nikki Tudor, <laughs> and also from my stepmom stepmom Marion. Thank you, and yeah, thank you to all of you. I know we've said it a couple of times now. I, I won't stop saying it. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it's been it's definitely been our honour to be able to have this initial chat with you, um, to to take this journey where you need it to go. So. Thank you, thank Sarah. You. Thank, thank you so thank much. You. And watch this space for the website. We'll let you know when it's ready. <laughs> okay. Bye, Kate. Lovely. Bye, everyone. Right. Thanks to everyone. You take care.